My younger brother, Eric, just recently got new glasses. Here's a picture of us from last weekend. Um, so you can see Eric on the right. He's, uh, he's usually on the live stream. Um, so that means that right now he is, he's holding his, his iPad and he realizes that we're talking about him and he's vibrating up and down with excitement and probably passing gas because <laughs> that's my brother. But anyway, so he's got, he got these glasses. Just re- very recently we realized that, that he needed glasses and we can, we can take the photo down. But, but um, so he does this, he does this really kind of cute thing where, because um, he... he as we discovered that he needed glasses, um, well, we, we asked him, so Eric, can you see more clearly? He says, yes. And, the, and he shows off his glasses and he's so proud of them and he looks just sporting in those glasses. And then he, and he says, well, when, when you wear the glasses, you're not fuzzy anymore. And, and so, so I said, Eric, so if you, if you take off your glasses, we're fuzzy? And he's like, yes. And he takes his glass up and goes, see? <laughs> now, because of Eric's condition, he, he, we, have to, we have to remind him, Eric, we, we can't see what you see. We, we, we just don't, we don't see it the same way. But that's actually a pretty good illustration for um, what we're going to be talking about today. I, I want to leave you with two biblical images and just to spend some time with these biblical images because on some level, all of us are like Eric, where we assume that the world that we see is the world that is. And we're going to look at a passage, and I invite you in your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to be in the first eight verses, especially of Isaiah chapter 6. And it's so appropriate that even as Brian was leading us in prayer, he talked about the throne room of God. Because this is one of two pictures in the Bible. One is in Isaiah 6. The other is in Revelation chapter 4. And that might be good even just to compare back and forth a little bit. Two visions that happened approximately 800 years apart from each other. But where Isaiah got this chance to see reality in a different way. It's as if his God goggles, his God glasses were put on his face. And the world went from being fuzzy to clear. So we're going to spend some time at Isaiah chapter 6. Now, this isn't part of a larger series. This is just a message that's been on my heart um, because there, there's something that comes out of it as we, as we think about the throne room and we think about the other, other image we're going to spend some time with today is the biblical image and metaphor of lips. Because the story is about the throne room, and it's about lips. Yeah. That I think you're going to find really, um, I hope you're going to find really encouraging, really comforting, too. Because, we'll see, as, as Isaiah is receiving this vision, it's fairly early in his ministry, King Uzziah has just died. And King Uzziah was one of the good kings of Israel, not a perfect king. His, he, the end of his reign wasn't, he made some significant errors. But he, w- he would be among the good kings. Well, in this case, specifically of Judah. He was a good king of Judah. And, and things looked very uncertain. Uzziah's son, was, uh, Jotham, was starting to come into power. We didn't, and they, at the time, they didn't know how this was all going to turn out. They've had, they've had a, a degree of like kind of governmental and leadership stability. And everything started to feel topsy-turvy. And the nation was, and maybe we can, we can relate to this in some way. You just think, well, where are things going? And things felt uncertain. And so God gave Isaiah a glimpse of this bigger picture. He allowed Isaiah to put his glasses on, his God glasses, if you would. And he was able to see an aspect of reality that is around us all the time, but to us at least largely invisible. So, let's spend some time in Isaiah 6 together. You got your Bibles open? Good. Yes? You can even use your, like, your, like your, your fake ones on your phone. That's okay. 
Um, so, but, but I would like you to, if you can, if you can have God's word in front of you, we'll project some of it, but more than anything, I, I want you in it because on some level, one of the reasons among many that we need the scriptures is the scriptures are our glasses for seeing the world more clearly. Otherwise, we can look at things that are fuzzy and we think that's actually how it is. We need, we need these glasses. We need these glasses to see the world more clearly. All right, Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two Wings, they covered their faces. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy. They're just calling to each other. And as they did, the sound, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds, they shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe is me, I cried. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth. And said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. So let's take some time together this image of, the, of the, the throne room. Now, in Revelation chapter 4, and if you've, got, if you've got Revelation chapter 4 open or in your Bibles, I'd encourage you to go back and forth a little bit because this vision is separated by about 800 years of history, but they're remarkably similar. And Revelation 4 verse 1 makes explicit something that's implicit in, in Isaiah's vision. And, and that's this, that, well, Revelation 4 one says this, after this I looked and there before me was a door, a door standing open in heaven. So here's the first thing I hope that we could know about this, this throne room business, is that the throne room of God is not some distant reality. It's not something that's happening in a far off land. It's not something that's happening in a far off time either. The throne room of God is reality. It is present with us. We just, most of the time, can't see it. That God is large and in charge right here, right now. And all that we do, all the ways that we live, all the ways that we, that we think and breathe and act and behave, on some level, it is before the throne room of God. And so you hear about what was happening in this throne room. There, there were some, some angels. Do you remember the name of the angels? What are they called? Seraphim. seraphim. Okay, seraphim. And uh, what were the attributes of those angels? What, do, what, does, the, what does the scripture say? Six wings. Six wings. So these are weird. These are weird angels. They, they've got two wings that are covering their faces because no one can look on the face of God. With two wings, they're covering their 
feet. Now, some Bible commentators say that might be a euphemism. Sometimes when the word feet shows up in the Bible, uh, okay, it's mostly in adult room, we're good. Uh, when the feet shows up in the Bible, sometimes it's a euphemism for privates. Um, so this might just be that, that the, the, angels, the angel is appropriately covered with wings. Might be that. Or it might literally mean feet. It's hard to tell. And with two, what did he do? They're flying. So, so um, artists have, have uh, looked at different images over history. So here, here's a, a picture from some of the iconographer. So you've got the six-winged creature. So maybe a seraphim looks a little bit like that. Maybe. You got the, you, at least they've got the six wings. Could be. Could be. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm not convinced because uh, as we keep reading, there's actually one important detail in the story that's missing in this picture. See if you can figure out later uh, what that is. But, but, but it's good for us to imagine. It's good for us to imagine what these angel creatures would look like. And here's the other thing that's important for us to know about angels. Because, uh, see, our, our cultural expectation of angels is extremely tame. When you go into the Hallmark store and there's the picture of the angels, and I need I, I get on a, on, a, on a rant on this. So I won't don't rant on it today because I'm not anti-angel. If you got your little angel figures, that's fine. That's nice. But every time angels show up in the Bible, every time angels show up in the Bible, the, the person or people who encounter the angels are terrified. So... When you see the angel, you know, creature, you know, the figurines in the Hallmark store, you go into Walmart, wherever it is, you get your angels from. It, the biblical angels are terrifying. Biblical angels are immensely powerful. Here's an example. Here's how we know why. So a little bit later in Isaiah. And so this is actually three kings later. Isaiah has had a long, has been a prophet for a long time. This is under King Hezekiah. The Assyrian army is at the gates of Jerusalem, and they're about to, they, they're, they're taunting the nation. And Hezekiah falls on his face before God and asks God to deliver them. And God does. And this is what he does. In this one night, Isaiah chapter 37, verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord. How many angels is this? One. One went out and put to death 100, 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. 185,000. That's one angel in one night. One angel, one night. That's why, we're, that's why when people see angels, they're terrified. Even though angels, when they're, when they're God's messengers... And they're on, they're on our side. They're defending us. That is amazing. But here's, if, if, they, if they are accomplishing the, the will of God in the moment, they, can, they have immense power. I am not aware, and, and this is even taking into, I am not aware of any other military event in history where 185,000 people died at once. That's one angel. That is one angel. And so here's Isaiah, and he's, he suddenly has this vision of the throne room of God. And there are multiple angels. They are calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Like, I'm imagine them a little bit like, like how, how a bird calls out, another bird calls back. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory and at the very sound, the very sound of it. What was going on? What was going on? The doorpost was shaking. The thresholds were shaking. Imagine the loudest, most intense rock concert you've ever been to. And the drums are just pounding your body. That's what it's like when an angel speaks. So Isaiah, he has this revelation of what's really going on, and he sees, sees these, these, I mean, this is just the angels, and, and to stand next to an angel is to like, it's, it's like to stand next to an atom bomb. 
There's an immense reverence for the power of the object, but you really hope it's on your side. Here's a room filled with angels. And this, this picture of the throne room, this is not a future reality. This is not a somewhere else, far, far away reality. This is reality. If our spiritual eyes had the capacity to see all that was happening around us all the time, that's, that's part of what we would see. God with that much majesty, God with that much power. And to a certain degree, we live, in, we live in the shadow lands. We live unaware of a lot of what's going on. I was imagining even this past week, um, so uh, spending some time in Seattle. And can you imagine if you were living in Seattle and it was always, always, always overcast? Sometimes it feels like that. But always, always, always overcast. And these clouds are just really low. And it can be a really gloomy place. But then when the clouds part, and there's that really amazing sunny day, and you get to see Mount Rainier, and you get to see out across the sound, it's gorgeous. I mean, that is a really beautiful place. But we live, in the, we live in the cloud bank. We live with constant overcast conditions, if you will, spiritually. There is so much going on around us that we just don't see. That right here, right now, in the present, God is large and in charge. Now, we may not understand all of what he's doing. We may not like all of what he's doing. Maybe we feel sometimes like, Job, God, what are you, like, why are the wicked prospering? Why are the righteous suffering? God, why is this happening to me? Those are all legitimate questions, all of them legitimate. There's a lot in life that does not make sense. And, and we live in the greater reality of the throne room of God is real is real. I think maybe one of the challenges perhaps we have in our era that is, makes understanding the majesty of God even more difficult than in Isaiah's time, I could be wrong about this. So I think for us, we sometimes have a hard time being in the present. Like, we have a hard time seeing all that's fully present in the present, but we just have a hard time being in the present in our world. So this past week, uh, my, 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 uh, my brother-in-law, Eric, and his family was here. And so we went up to Leavenworth because if you have, to, you, know, if you have guests in town, of course you take them to Leavenworth. It's kind of like the law. you got to take them to Leavenworth, show it off, all those kind of things. And so we're walking through this, you know, Leavenworth. And it's this beautiful, you, you know it, kind of Bavarian-themed village, and then behind the village, you look up, and there's the, the enchantments and snow-capped mountains, and it is, it's gorgeous. We, guy, folks, we won the geographic lottery. I mean, this is, this is a beautiful place to live. Amen. They're looking around, there's Leavenworth, and pe where people are walking down the little Leavenworth streets and the shops, and it's so sweet, and it's so wonderful. And, and... As we're all walking around, and when you, especially when you see people and they've stopped, maybe they're sitting down on a bench, a third to a half of them, what are they doing? <laughs> we, you've seen this, right? Perhaps we've even done this. We're surrounded by an absolutely beautiful, I mean, beautiful landscape and what are we doing? And so whether that is this screen-based fixation on the past, oh, look what my friends on Facebook are doing. 
Oh, look at these Instagram photos. Or if, if you're like me, this is, this is one of my liabilities, or your head is already in the future, what do I need to do next? What's my list? What's next on the agenda? Like, you're just thinking and planning. About, anybody, any planners in the room? Yeah. You get in your, stu- your head gets stuck in the future. We have a hard time being fully present in the moment. We've got these incredible, wonderful distraction devices that keep us from being present in the moment. And, and if you really think about it, I mean, the, 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 the reality that we see on these devices, and it is a form of reality, but it's an airbrushed reality. I mean, people don't look like that. They don't act like that. We have a hard time with reality. There are so many things going on around us that we just do not see. And the throne room of God, the throne room of God may be one of the most significant things that we miss. When you hear these passages, you know, Isaiah 6, Revelation 4, the throne room of God, what do you imagine that being in the throne room of God would be like? Like, what, what, what do you think it would be like for you to be there? Overwhelming, exactly. What else? Awesome, yeah, awesome. What else? Huge, beautiful. Would you be terrified? Ter- terrifying? I, I, like, I love this song, I can only imagine, and I'm standing in your glory, how will my heart feel, will I dance, will I fall on my, fa- you know, fall on my knees, I don't know what I'm going to do, Jesus, but the point of this passage is that if we could see it, that's the reality, that's the foundation of reality, all creation flows out of the goodness and creative action of God. In him we live and move and have our being. He is the one who holds all things together. And he, no matter what you are going through, friend, today, he is still on his throne. He is still in charge. And he knows exactly what you are going through. You are not here by accident. Kids right now are studying the book of Esther. There's a beautiful phrase in the book of Esther. For such a time as this. You are here for such a time as this. God is completely aware of what you are going through. Even when you are not. Completely aware. Which is why we can call out to him. We can plead with him. We can, we can be angry with him if need be. And he is still on the throne. And he is still more more powerful than we could ever, ever imagine. And if you or I or we, we found ourselves like fully aware of the throne room of God, we would have probably about the same response as Isaiah did, right? So Isaiah sees this, and what does he say? what's, What's his response? Woe is me! Woe is me, I am a man of, what's the phrase? Unclean lips. lips. Let's talk about lips. Let's talk about lips. Let's talk about unclean lips. Think of all the things you do with your lips. So all the thing, I mean, everything you eat, everything you drink passes through your lips. And sometimes those things are good for you. Sometimes they're bad for you. Sometimes they're things that could be good for you, but you have too much of it and it makes it bad for you. Or you think of the things that we do with our lips. How many people here remember their first kiss? Yeah. Our lips are one of the ways that we make connection. Some of, the, some of the kisses in your life and those connections in your life are, are foundations to your greatest points of joy. Others, perhaps, to your greatest points of regret. Some horrible things can happen if you kiss the wrong person. 
Some horrible things can also happen if you don't kiss the right person enough. Think about your lips. Even touch your lips. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. So all the things you do with your lips, including we speak. All the words that we speak. For many of us, this is certainly true for me, my greatest regrets in life have to do with the things I spoke. Our words create worlds. We can cause tremendous devastation with our unclean lips. Jesus says that's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. And we don't need to worry so much about the, about the uncleanliness that comes in from our food, but it's what comes out of our lips. I am a man of unclean lips in a people of unclean lips. I was watching a Netflix special this week um, where a, a famous comedian was being honored with the Mark Twain um, Comedy Award. It seemed like a really good idea. It looked really good. Um, turned it on. And, of course, it was, it was at the Kennedy Center. I mean, super fantastic, just elegant setting. And everybody's got their best, like their, their best clothes on. There's tuxedos and really fancy dresses everywhere. And they kind of start out talking. And people are there with their families. And there's little kids. And they're all celebrating this grand event. And then they start talking. And there's just F-bomb, 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 F-bomb. And you think, what are we doing? I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. All these things we do, we hurt one another with our lips, we lie with our lips. We consume too much with our lips. We abuse one another with our lips. We manipulate people with our lips. It's very upsetting. <laughs> our lips our lips. And so then one of these seraphim, what does he do? Takes a coal, a live coal in his hand. So that's where that picture, I, 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 if you're an artist, draw a seraphim this week. Let's imagine together. It's good to imagine. God gave us an imagination for a reason. Takes, his, takes a live coal in his hand and he touches Isaiah's mouth. That's a very strange image. I'd love to spend more time with that. But let's just think about the lips and what, and what this, what said at that moment. Okay, at that moment. He touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So as Isaiah is standing before the throne room of God, he is overwhelmed with the power and majesty of it. He realizes, he realizes how messed up he truly is. And then an angel comes and reminds him that his, that his sin has been taken away, his his, his guilt has been taken away. His sin has been atoned for. And the fullness of that atonement wouldn't even be happening for another approximately 770 years. Because who's the ultimate source of our atonement? And what did he do? He died on the cross. And he redeemed your lips. So I want to ask you, what would you do if you realized that your sin really was atoned for. Because as Isaiah, as Isaiah starts to grasp what's going on, he starts to hear the call of God in his life. So who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah said this. What did he say? Here am I. Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. This is why this is this is why I wanted to spend some time with this the, with the throne room and with the lips. 
The throne room of God is reality. God is still large in charge and in power if we could only fully see it. And our lips are a mess. And Jesus has atoned for our sin. And as we do, as we understand that, we understand that, that God has a call on each and every one of us. You are not here by accident. We do live in an uncertain time. We don't know what the future holds. I think we live in one of the harder eras, at least in modern history. As, as, as the culture around us is becoming increasingly post-Christian, where following Jesus will not win you accolades. And here's the good news. God knows this. God knows this. You are here. I am here for such a time as this. That he is right here with you. So we do not need to live in fear. We can live in faith, knowing that God has a call for you and for me and for us in this moment of life. He is completely aware. He is completely aware of what's going on in your world, in my world, in the world. So how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? Unashamed. What else do you say? Awesome. How does that make you feel? Loved. Safe. How does that make you feel? Right. That he, you know that you are loved no matter how hard you're struggling. Even when things don't make sense, God is still there. We don't need to understand it to trust it. Who will go? Here I am. Send me. Would you stand with me as we respond? If you're able. If you're able. If you would with me, we'd just take a moment and, 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 and you, can, you, know, you can do the, do the church thing where you put your hand on the, on the seat in front of you so you can close your eyes and not feel like you're going to wobble. I want you to imagine as you, as you do. If, you, if you're comfortable closing your eyes for a moment, I'd like you to imagine right now the throne room of God. Like if the curtain of, of in front of us, if, 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 if you could just see it, if you could just see it. God in all of his majesty, God in all of his power, God in all of his authority. If you could just see it. And maybe like Isaiah, you imagine yourself standing in front of God and you feel ashamed. Think of all the dumb things you've said, all the, all the frogs you've kissed. All of the regrets. And you, and you experience God saying, I know, I've seen it all. See. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And I would just invite you, friend, as you think about that, to take a moment under your breath to pray the Isaiah prayer. Lord, here I am. Send me. Just, just you and Jesus for a moment. Imagine him on his throne. And what might you say to him in that moment as you think about your life, 
You think about what you're going through right now. Lord, here I am. Send me. Lord, here we are. Send us. Lord, here I am. Here I am. I'm not distracted. Here I am. Amen.